is rising, eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. Hope is stirring, hearts are yearning for you. We long for you. Cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Washed away Hosanna Hosanna You are the God who saves us Worthy of all our praises Hosanna Hosanna Come out
Good morning, Parkway Church. This is Pastor Jamie coming to you with our third online service. I can't wait for the time when we can meet together in person, but until then, we're worshiping together in our homes. If you or if someone you know of has a need that you think the church can help with during this time of crisis, please contact the church office at 703 703- 5905199. We want to continue to be the hands and feet of Jesus during these days. Also, if you're visiting with us for the first time, you don't normally uh, visit with us in our services, uh, you can use your cell phone to text the word welcome. Again, text the word welcome to our church phone number, which is 703 590 5199. Again, that's the word welcome to 703-590-5199. We'd be glad to connect with you and to share with you about what is going on here in our church and when I keep you updated when we're able to have in-person worship services again. Also, just to let you know, um, throughout all of next week, Monday through Friday, we're going to have a little bit of a fun uh, family fun time, okay? And this is family in this broad sense as a church family. And even those who are watching us online, if you'd like to participate, you can. Uh, each day we're going to post something fun for you to do at your house. And we're going to ask that you take a video or take a picture of those things, post them on our Facebook page, or send them as a text message uh, to us so that we can uh, be able to post them and uh, all enjoy what we're doing. One day we might ask you for your whole family to put on crazy socks and take a picture of that or uh, to get together as a family and make uh, your dinner meal and then take a picture of your creation. Or we may ask you to go out and do something silly outdoors like hugging a tree or uh, laying in the grass or doing something else. So uh, be on the lookout for those. That'll begin on Monday, tomorrow. Uh, you'll see the posts on Facebook and our website, as well as uh, you should be receiving a letter in the mail with each day as well. All right, well, we're going to begin our worship service and, with prayer, and then I'm going to invite you to stand and worship with us. Dear Heavenly Father, we come into your presence. We thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for our church and how we're still able to be the body of Christ in these days. I pray, Lord, that you'd meet with us this morning, or that you would speak to our hearts, and that our hearts might be intertwined with yours. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in your homes, if you would, let's stand together and let's begin our worship time. There the sun of 
as your bride forever when we see Hey there, Justin here, and I wanted to show you one of the easiest ways for you to give to your church. All you gotta do, send a text message. Here, I'll show you how I set it up. All I need to do is text an amount to 84321, and a link will be sent back to me. I'll tap on that link, select my church, add an email address for the receipt, enter in my payment information, and that's it. From now on, when I want to give, I just grab my phone and text an amount. Alright, let's donate $10 now. And that's it. Oh! Oh, I added an extra zero. Yeah, I'm gonna need to fix that. Um, luckily I can. Since it's been less than 30 minutes, I just send the word refund and that last donation will be refunded. Whew. <laughs> I'm gonna try it again. And there we go. And that, my friends, is how you can give with a text message. Happy giving. There is And so we come to Matthew chapter 21 on this Palm Sunday, and we read these words from the Scripture. Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, then you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he uh, will send them. Verse 4, All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the fowl of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt and laid their clothes on them, and they set him, Jesus, on them. 
And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come to, into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, and they were saying, Who is this? And so the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from, the Na from Nazareth, Nazareth of Galilee. As we celebrate this Palm Sunday, as we see Jesus moving towards Jerusalem, we see these strange instructions that Jesus gives the disciples at the beginning of the passage. Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied in a colt with her. So you've got mama donkey and baby donkey. And loose them both, bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them. And immediately they will release them, they'll send them. Now, one of the first questions I asked this morning is why does Jesus make this strange request? Why does he want a little donkey to ride into Jerusalem on? Well, we don't have to go very far to find out the answer, but we first have to deal with the owners of the donkey, right? Jesus says, hey, I want those two animals, and if the owners object, if they think that you're thieves coming to rob and to steal them of their animals, what you're to tell them is the password. And the password is, the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, has need of them. So what would have been going on in the owners' minds of these donkeys? Would they have in mind that somehow uh, they maybe knew Jesus, they were followers of Christ, they were just waiting on His instruction, maybe He had called ahead and said, hey, uh, one day I'm going to need them, you need to have them tied up so my disciples know exactly where to go to get them? Was that the case? Was it some master or some lord that's generic to say someone above you has need of them? And so, uh, though you may be the owner, uh, just know that uh, someone of higher authority uh, requires use of them. Or better yet, I think what this is saying is that God needs them. That the Lord, God, needs them. Because Jesus Christ as Lord was not a title that was used for Jesus up until this time. We don't find that uh, description until later. And so the idea of the Lord needing them was really reserved from the Lord God Almighty, the Father. And so if we read it that way, uh, the Lord God, the Sovereign One, the Creator of the universe has need of them. And immediately they will send the donkey with you. Boy, can you think about that for just a moment? That what Jesus is saying here in the Scripture is that the Lord has, by divine appointment, allowed this mother to have this cult at this season of life, on a particular day, at a particular time, so that the God of the universe would set these two animals aside to be used for something pretty special. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty powerful to think about. Divine appointment for the special occasion. Now, let me give you a word of caution, and let me give myself a word of caution before I continue on into looking at this passage. Some sage advice comes to us by John Calvin, the reformer, who said, where, the scripture, where God has shut his mouth, we too must be silent. Now, let me just tell you that that is good advice. Where God has not spoken, we too should close our mouths, and we too should not speak. And I oftentimes repeat the line that the Bible is the master at understatement, that there are so many things that uh, is lacking in a story that you would think, boy, that would be really good information to have. 
Why did he say that? Why did he go there? Uh, why? Uh, what happened in the years that happened between this and this? I mean, think about it. We've been studying the life of Moses. Uh, Moses um, was a baby. And then we find him again when he's an adult. When he's an adult, he murders somebody. He goes out, and then for 40 years, he's living uh, with this his father-in-law and his wife, and he's having a family and a shepherd, and we pick him back up again when he's 80 years old. I mean, this is just the way the Bible works. You know, even the life of Jesus, we have the birth narrative with such great detail about, uh, you know, the shepherds being, you know, uh, met with the angels. We have Mary and Joseph because they're going to be uh, taxed for the census. We have uh, the, the Magi who are coming when he's about two years old to his house. We have, you know, just this great description of uh, uh, because of the census, not having really any rooms available, going and living in, uh, being born in the cave uh, there, uh, being laid in a manger. I mean, all of these are descriptions. We pick back up with the life of Jesus uh, when he is about 12. We have one instance. And then we pick back up again when he's 30 years old. And then we have a treasure trove of information as he's ministering on earth. But even the Bible says, if we wrote down everything that Jesus said or everything Jesus did, uh, then we wouldn't have really enough books in the world to contain it all. And so you only have a piece. And Jesus, when he was talking to the disciples, would oftentimes say, uh, I'm showing this to you, I'm telling you this, but you're not, you're not supposed to tell anybody. Well, I want to know. Well, that's just the curious mind that I have, but it's dangerous to read in between the lines. It's dangerous to try to fill in the blanks, because when God has ceased speaking, uh, we should also cease speaking. And so, uh, Matthew, the gospel writer, helps us. He, he kind of, he's like, okay, you know, in, in 2020, you know, there's going to be this church that's going to go through this uh, thinking about this, this passage, this event, and I want to help them out. So, Matthew helps us to not have to read in between the lines of why a donkey, why a cult especially, what this symbolism means to the ear and the eye of those first century Jews. Because in verse 4 he says, All of this was done that it might be fulfilled, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, and then he gives a Scripture reference. If your Bible tries to help you out, it has already italicized them, indented them, in some way told you this is an Old Testament uh, inscription, an Old Testament verse. Verse 5, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the fowl of a donkey. Now, you ask me, well, where is this verse found in the Old Testament? Maybe we can go back and we can look it up. Well, this is actually two verses in the Old Testament that Matthew has kind of brought together to create one verse. And so, one part of this verse comes to us by the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah is one of my favorite prophets to study. In Isaiah chapter 62 is where we'll find uh, one half of uh, this uh, declaration of the Old Testament. Give you a little bit of context, Isaiah chapter 62. The scripture says, For Zion's sake I will not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest. This is parallelism that, G, uh, that uh, the prophet Isaiah is going to use here to talk to us about how God's going to operate. For Zion's sake, for Jerusalem's sake, for my people's sake, I will not be silent. I will not hold my peace. I will not be absent from the peoples of the earth. For Jerusalem, for my people's sake, I will not rest. 
I won't go to sleep. I won't go on vacation. I won't be uh, deterred from my mission. And this is the mission that Isaiah tells us is the mission of God. Until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and salvation as a lamp that burns. What Isaiah says is that from God's perspective, he will not rest, he will not slumber, he will not go on vacation, he will not withhold his uh, word from going forth until salvation comes. And this is how salvation will come. Verse 11 of Isaiah 62. Indeed, the Lord has proclaimed to the ends of the, wor to the world, Say to the daughter of Zion, Surely your salvation is coming. And so in the mind of Matthew, he wants us to set our minds in this, in this fact. That when Jesus comes and he asks for a donkey and the colt of a donkey, that what this symbolizes is that God has brought peace, God has brought salvation to the world. And then the other part of Matthew, uh, his quote comes from Zechariah 9.9. 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just, and he comes with salvation. Lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the fowl of a donkey. And for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, the people of Israel waited for that day when the God who has not rested and the God who has not withheld his peace would come sending forth an agent of change, an agent of peace, an agent of salvation, one who they could celebrate and rejoice in as bringing salvation, and they would know that this is the agent God had sent, that this was the salvation of the Lord on full display because He comes riding on a donkey but more specifically a colt, the fowl of a donkey, the king of salvation. And here Jesus on this Palm Sunday comes arriving as the king of kings and the lord of lords in pomp and ceremony, but he comes lowly and in humility riding the fowl of a donkey. He does not come to signify that war is coming, but more importantly, he comes to signify that peace has come. He's called the Prince of Peace in Isaiah. And now that Prince of Peace has come, and he comes riding to Jerusalem as the King of Peace. We remember what Paul said in Romans chapter 5 when he deals with the doctrine of justification by faith. And let me read to you the words that Paul uses. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God. Now let me stop there for just a second. In our country today, it has been said that we live lives of quiet desperation. Augustine, the philosopher, he looked out into the world and he saw that the uh, human mind was creative. The human mind was always coming up with new things to do and uh, creative things. I mean, it is, a, it is an interesting time to be alive I was reminded just uh, this past week of the great invention that was put on Shark Tank. I don't know if you watched that show, uh, but this is where entrepreneurs go and show their product to a group of investors, and they decide whether or not they want to invest in the product or not. Well, one of those products was called the Bacon Clock, and this was basically a toaster that had a... Um, 
alarm clock attached to it that you would put beside your bed. And each night you would put bacon in the bacon clock. And then at a certain period of time, the clock would turn on uh, like your alarm clock and uh, it would begin to cook the bacon. So that you would wake up to the smell of bacon, you would wake up to the, you know, the refreshing scent of bacon in the morning. And the first thing you could do is, uh, groggy-eyed and all, is open up your bacon clock and eat your bacon. Now, surprise, surprise, the Shark Tank investors decided that was a bad idea for, you know, maybe legal reasons. They were afraid it was going to burn down a bunch of houses. But, hey, that is the human mind at work. I love bacon. I hate waking up to the sound of an alarm, but I would sure love to wake up to the smell of bacon every day. That's the creative mind, that restless mind at work. Well, Augustine said it this way. When he looked out at the uh, restless mind of mankind, he said, O Lord, Thou hast made us for Thyself. Our hearts are always restless. Restless until they find their rest in Thee. What Augustine was saying and what I'm trying to explain to us today is this. Our heart is always restless. Our mind always restless. Our lives restless. I think during this time of uh, Corona quarantine, Corona stay at home orders and all the rest... This has been an opportunity for us to rest, for us to come to a quiet peace that we're always going, we're always doing, we're always involved in something. And in our involvement in other things, it has really stopped us from being involved in the things God said were most important. And one of those things that God says is most important is our relationship with the Almighty. We've talked about it before, but the number one commandment, our number one uh, job as followers of God is to love the Lord with everything we are. Then to love others, just like, hey, just like you love yourself, right? To love God with everything we are, our soul, our mind, our heart, our strength. And the Bible says when we love God, then everything else will be added unto us. Well, for a long time, I think people around the world, and especially here in the United States, have been focused on the things that have been added to our lives, rather than being focused on making God center of our lives. And here we come to this idea of being restless. And maybe this is an opportunity for us to seek the peace that comes from knowing God. Paul, in his letters to the churches, he goes on to say that we are at war with God. We are enemies of God. We are alien to the things of God. That in our lost state, we are far from God. But that we have a God who is always reaching out, offering to us peace. Friend, if you are at war with God, if you're far from God, if if you and God maybe aren't on the same page this morning, let me encourage you with this. Though you might feel far from God, God is right there with you. The Bible says that we are never too far away from God that He cannot hear even a whispered prayer. That in the stillness and in the silence of our hearts, God can speak. And right now, if you are far from God, know this. God can bring you peace. A peace that passes all understanding. Peace with God. Jesus would say that uh, in His last will and his testament, before He leaves, what He's leaving with to us, He said, Peace... I leave you. Not my jewelry, not my house, not my car, but peace. Peace that only I give, that the world cannot give. And I give you this so that your heart would not be troubled. 
listen, followers of God, if you know who Jesus is and He's your Lord and Savior, you have a peace that the rest of the world is clamoring to find in these days. Coming and riding on a donkey towards Jerusalem came the bringer of peace, the bringer of salvation, the one who would once and for all bring peace to the troubled hearts of man. And now in rest, now in rest, we can worship the Lord with all that we are. In peace and knowing that if we have God, we have everything we need. At peace, knowing that the greatest need of my life is not things here on earth, but the greatest need of my life is something spiritual, something that is beyond coronavirus, beyond what's in the bank account, beyond what's in the retirement fund. It is a peace that says to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. A peace that says salvation comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. How much is that peace worth to you in these days? I can tell you that in the past few weeks, that peace has meant more to me than just about anything. You know, I'm certainly concerned for some of you who maybe have conditions that make you more vulnerable to this disease, and I don't want to minimize it. That's one of the reasons why we made the difficult decision to cancel all of our in-person uh, services even before uh, we were required to, simply because we care about your health and safety. But make no mistake about it, in times of uncertainty, knowing that I'm at peace with God and that it doesn't matter what happens to my life, it doesn't matter what happens uh, to my finances, it doesn't matter what happens uh, outside of the things that I can control, having peace with God means everything. And that's worth everything to me. Why does Jesus want this colt to ride in on? Why this donkey that's never been ridden before? Well, certainly his mother is there to uh, make him feel a little better, so he's not so skittish with the crowd shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. But it's also a representation. This colt who has not been tamed... This colt who's never been ridden, who doesn't know how to act when a rider is on his back, he is immediately tamed by the Lord who sits on his back. Jesus, who can tame the heart of this donkey, whose heart, the donkey's heart, can be tamed almost immediately just by being in the presence of of Jesus, the Lord who brings peace. Compare that with the hearts of those in the crowd. The hearts who will cry out with their lips, Hosanna, Hosanna. And in just a few days will shout with that same heart and those same lips, Crucify Him, Crucify Him. Hosanna, Hosanna. Listen to the words the crowd screams. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Again, in the Jewish mind, this is a representation of God. This is God's representative, God's agent. This person who we're crying out to, we believe and we declare, represents God. Basically saying He's our King. Verse 10 when he came to Jerusalem, all the city was moved. And what they were saying is, who is this? Who is he? The simple answer is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Here he is in Jerusalem. You see, Jesus was the king they needed. The king who offered salvation and peace. But they're not the, he's not the king they wanted. 
The king they were hoping for would be a king who would come in and overthrow Rome. Rome, who had Jerusalem and Israel under such uh, tight uh, security, who had taken over the government and who had, was running day-to-day -day operations. They wanted a king who would come in and overthrow the, uh, the tyrants who were running the city, who were making their life miserable. They wanted a king who would come in riding a, on a horse, a stallion, a king of war. Of course, they will crown this king in just a few days. But Jesus will not be crowned with a crown of gold and jewels, but he'll be crowned with a crown of thorns. They wanted a king who could perform miracles like Jesus performed, so that if the soldiers that were going out to battle and war with this king, if they ever got hungry, that he could perform a miracle and be able to feed this hungry army. But instead of feeding a hungry army, Jesus fed 5,000 on a coast of a shore and did so with just a few pieces of bread and fish. They wanted a king, if someone got injured on the battlefield, that he could heal them instantly so they could get back into the battle. But instead, Jesus healed the leper and the blind and the lame, the outcasts of society. They wanted a king who could raise the dead soldiers to newness of life. And instead, they found a king who raised Lazarus, his friend from the dead. They wanted a king who would come to overthrow their oppressor. But they did not want a king to come and rule their hearts. They wanted an earthly king that perhaps they could manipulate. They didn't want a king that came with the authority of God who dictated all things as being right and true and expose their immorality, expose their sin, expose that they were nowhere near being close to God, but yet they were far from Him. And I wonder in just these closing moments if we still have that problem today that we want a Savior, but we don't really want a Savior like Jesus. Jesus condemns people to hell. We want to believe that Jesus comes and makes our life better. We want to believe in this idea that Jesus brings peace with God, but man, we don't want to believe that Jesus would also be the hand of justice. We don't mind Jesus coming to be Lord of our lives as long as that what that means is we get good things from God, that He's the uh, Santa Claus, Easter Bunny, and Tooth Fairy all in one, and all that we uh, need, we just go and we say, hey, God, I want this, and He says, here it is, and He dispenses it to us like a vending machine. No, we don't want a God who rules our lives with authority because we don't want to submit to His rule and authority in our daily lives. We want a Savior who will make it easy for us to go to heaven, but we don't want a Savior who says, this is how I want you to live for me day to day. Jesus wasn't the Savior they expected, and He wasn't the Savior they wanted. And maybe we too sometimes have the wrong expectations for Jesus. Jesus came to rule our hearts, to take control of our lives. Jesus came to bring you peace that passes all understanding, a peace with God. The people in the crowd did not submit. And I suppose our question this morning is, what about you? 
Will you find today the peace that God offers? The peace that comes only through Jesus? Will you find today Jesus who wants to be the Lord of your heart? To rule and reign and to do something more with your life than you could ever do apart from Him. He can be found. Very simply, He can be found by praying. It, something simple like this, Dear Lord, I recognize that I'm a sinner who's far from You. Praying something like, Lord, though I'm so far from You, I believe in what Jesus did for me on the cross. I put my faith and trust in Christ, and I commit my life, my life, my everything, to you. Help me to live and be more like Christ each and every day. I'm asking you to set up rule and reign in my heart, and I'm asking for you to help me to listen and see and walk in your path. Let me be more like you each and every day. Amen. You see, a prayer like that is a prayer that I think God honors. I'm not asking you to repeat after me because I think you have a prayer that's already on your lips. A prayer you know that you need to say before the Lord. Maybe this morning you're not far from God. Maybe there are some areas of your life where you've not given up full control to God. And you can pray in these moments and ask God to take all of you, to use all that you are, so that He can mold and shape and make you more into His image day by day. However the Lord has spoken, just know this, salvation has come Peace with God is yours today if you'd receive it. Pass me not, O oh gentle Savior. Sweet relief, me.